And so I have made myself this presentation um, to give myself a little bit of structure and um, to just cover the basics of Riesling because there is so much to know. Um, yes, there's so much we could talk about, but so let's just get started. So the title here is Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About German Riesling But Were Afraid to Ask because it's been said to me that German wines, even for professionals, are the bane of some people's lives and, you know, pronunciation and the weird German wine law and blah, blah. And somehow in all of this insecurity about the wine law and getting it right or wrong or understanding it, the joy of Riesling sometimes gets forgotten. But it's such a distinctive grape that we just need to get a grip, okay? So... Um, I always like to start with a map of Europe because in that map of Europe, it, be it becomes absolutely clear that Germany is in the very heart of Europe. Um, because sometimes people think that um, wine growing is just important in Italy, France and Spain. But in fact, um, viticulture was very, very, very widespread in the medieval warm period as far north as Poland. And we now, of course, everybody knows that there's wine growing, gorgeous wine growing in England too. Um, but Germany, you see, um, and Germany's wine regions, if you draw a line between that little piece of land called Luxembourg and the furthest, the westernmost corner of the Czech Republic, um, you probably, you're just about uh, on the 51st degree of latitude and this is where German viticulture really has its northerly confine. So we're really very, very much in the European heartland. Now, Riesling is a grape variety and it is a fragrant white, dry or sweet wine made from this grape. So this is just a, a dictionary um, definition of Riesling. And then comes the quote from Queen Bee, from the absolute wonder woman of wine, Chances Robinson. She said that Riesling is one of the world's greatest white wine grapes, capable of making particularly geographically expressive and long-lived white wines at all sweetness levels, which means all dryness levels too, so from bone dry to tooth breakingly sweet and anything in between. And this is where already where the problem starts because Riesling is so many things. So the actual plant, the actual vine, Riesling, is very hard wood, much harder than many other grape varieties. And this is why it is so suited to Germany, which before climate change was still a lot cooler than it is now. And so the hardiness of the wood meant that it would withstand winter frosts much better than other grape varieties. So this is nothing really to, to do with the way it tastes or the way it grows. It's just that it survives in a cool climate when you have very harsh winters. And you could have had, there were winters in Germany with below 20 degrees Celsius. So this used to happen a lot and Riesling could withstand it. And some people actually believe that Riesling got to a predominant stage in Germany, especially in places like the Rheingau, after a series of particularly cold winters in the early 18th century. The other thing that's great about Riesling is that it buds late. So um, you have spring frosts, and um, they usually can last until the 15th of May, until mid-May, and sometimes even later. But for Riesling, that's not such a problem because it's a late starter. And so it misses that spring frost danger. And, um, and therefore, you have fruit, you know, yeah, you have fruit and, and that doesn't freeze, little shoots that don't freeze to death. And the interesting thing is that Riesling, and this is very important in terms of German Riesling, it's a grape variety that is mid to late ripening. That means, say, if you have Pinot varieties, if you're a winemaker who grows Pinot varieties, who grows Silvana, who grows uh, Müller Thurgau, and who grows Riesling, Riesling is the grape that you will harvest last because it's a mid to late ripening grape variety. And we shall see that this actually has a big bearing on why Riesling tastes the way it does. 
Riesling also has an affinity for Botrytis cinerea, for noble rot, because it has um, thin skins. And probably the single most distinguishing factor of Riesling is its acidity. And um, I love acid, and I will talk about acid later on as well, but high acid is really what makes Riesling stand out. And for me, acid in wine, in any wine, whether it is Riesling or whether it is fine champagne or great Pinot Noir or great Sangiovese, Nebbiolo, you name it, I love high acid wines. And to me, acid is like the spotlight. That's kind of this halogen spotlight that shines brightly and nothing can hide. And this is what makes Riesling so transparent and so exciting. And also the other way of looking at Riesling is that you probably know that we have very, very, very aromatic grape varieties like Muscat or like Gewürztraminer or Sauvignon Blanc, whereas uh, we have less aromatic varieties like Chardonnay. That's why you can smell wine making so much on Chardonnay, like malolactic fermentation with that creaminess or the new oak or the, so, so in a way that's, you can smell that so well because Chardonnay is not that aromatic. Riesling is pitched in between the very aromatic and the less aromatic grape variety. So it's semi-aromatic, which means that it has a terpene content. Terpenes are the, the, um, the volatile um, flavor compounds that are um, in the grape's skin and in the grape flesh. And so where, you know, like Riesling is just semi-aromatic and it can have beautiful flavors, especially for me of citrus, which drives me wild. I love that when I can smell citrus flavors. Sometimes it's floral, sometimes it's herbal. So um, this is to me the joy of Riesling. Now, I am German. What would a German girl be without her statistics? Okay, so um, we have in 2018, Germany had 102,873 hectares of vineyards. And we have 13 wine regions in Germany. I'll show you in a, on a map in a little moment. And those 13 regions in Germany cover four degrees of latitude. So if we start in Baden at the Swiss border, in the very south of Germany, you're at 47 and a half. And we go up to the vineyards of Saale und Strut to 51 and a half. So that's four degrees of latitude. And Germany is a, is a very old wine producing country but it's only the 14th largest in the world. And the, one of the hindering factors that it hasn't got more importance in the wine world, but which also on the other side makes it beautiful because it is so diverse, is that the producer base is very, very fragmented. So um, the German wine statistics are published, but the latest figures here are from 2016, not from 2018. Um, but we had 15,931 estates, so almost 16,000 estates, and most of them have between half a hectare and 10 hectares of vines. And this shows you how fragmented the German wine industry really is. And also, this is a development that has taken place over the past 30 years. Just over a third of Germany's vineyards are now planted to red varieties when two thirds are still absolutely in the hand of white varieties. And this, I, I think information is only ever good if it comes with context. So if we look at the world wine production, if we look at all of the vineyards across the world, there are 7,449,000 7, hectares of vineyards in the world. And in Germany, there are just 103,000 hectares. So Germany has just got 1% of the world's vineyards. So it's a tiny, tiny little operator. As a, as a contrast, just the wine region of Bordeaux alone in France has got 112,000 hectares. So Bordeaux alone has got more hectares than Germany. Champagne has about 34,000 hectares. New Zealand um, has about 39,000 hectares. And as, as I said, Germany has just below 103,000 hectares. 
However, today we want to focus on Riesling. And you see that we take, if we take all of the Riesling vineyards in the world and the greatest Riesling producers, you see that Germany has got an immense head start. Nobody grows as much Riesling as the Germans do. So Germany, which has 1% of the world's vineyard, has got 51% of the world's Riesling vineyards. And this is why Riesling is such a flagship variety for Germany. And of course, we know the other interesting Riesling countries. What I find surprising here in this statistic is that Romania has 6,121 hectares of Riesling. And I have to confess to my shame, I've never tasted a Romanian Riesling. So I need to put that on my to-do list. Then this is followed by the US with 4,600 hectares. And we know that most of them are, um, there's some in the Finger Lakes, but a lot of them are in Washington on the West Coast. And then we have France with 4,000 hectares of uh, Riesling and they are pretty much all in Alsace. And we know how thrilling Alsace Riesling can be, which is something we have to bear in mind later when we look at Baden. And then another absolutely distinct, perfect new world style of Riesling is in Australia, predominantly from Eden and Clare. Um, but also ever more in other places. And I love that diversity. Then we have Ukraine. Again, never had a Ukrainian Riesling, never had a Chinese Riesling. And then, of course, there's Riesling in a few places uh, in the rest of the world, but it doesn't show up on the stats. But I just wanted to show you Germany, just 1% of world vineyards, but 51% of the world's Riesling. So here we go. Yeehaw. These are our 13... Um, growing regions in Germany. And as I said earlier, if you draw a kind of line between Luxembourg and uh, the Czech Republic, you will almost have the northern confine of viticulture. And you see that our outliers, we have two outliers, are Saxon here in the east, which is on the river Elbe. And then we have Saale Unstrut, which is actually furthest north, um, is on the two rivers Saale and Unstrut when all of the rest of the German wine regions are really down in the southwest. And so you have the R up here, which you know, um, I don't know whether if I point my cursor, can you see my cursor on the screen? Oh, perfect. Good. So here we have the, the R region, for, which is very well known for its Pinot Noir. And then we have Mittelrhein, which is actually this kind of region here that goes from from where the end of the Rheingau is all the way up to Bonn. And there is thrilling Riesling here, even though many people sort of forget Mittelrhein, but it's a thrilling, thrilling region. Here we have Mosel Saarruwe. And uh, because of the coloring here, I don't know how clear it is, but you can see the little Mosel River snaking in its sort of meandering band. And then of course we have here the little spot of Rheingau, which is really, really important for Riesling's history. And we have the Nahe, this purple spot here, which I think makes some of the most thrilling, thrilling and exciting Rieslings today. And you have this vast part of Rheinhessen, where you have very, very diverse Riesling um, from sort of Rialit, um, the Red Slope, sort of really, savory Riesling and then you have these cool cool Rieslings further south from um, the limestone soils and then we have the Pfalz which is this pink spot here. Pfalz, those gorgeous dry Rieslings that are just oh um, they are there to me are joyful and measured and really if you like dry that's where you should go. And now this is interesting when people speak about Riesling they usually speak about Pfalz, Rheinhessen, Mosel, Saarruwe, and the Rheingau. And they completely forget about Franken, Franconia, Württemberg, and Baden. And when you go to the big tastings in Germany, say the VDP release tasting, many people don't deign to taste Riesling from Baden or from Württemberg. They sort of pull their nose up. And I think um, that's really stupid because if you look here, if you are, say, where are we? Where's my cousin? In Freiburg. You go across the River Rhine. Here's the Rhine Plain. 
And what is here, which you can't see because this is a German map? Here is Alsace. And you know how celebrated Alsace Riesling is. So it would be a fool who ignored Baden Riesling because it can be very, very interesting. Uh, just because it's just like Alsace Riesling. It's got, it's got it's rounder, riper, but just as expressive. There are also historic Riesling vineyards in Württemberg and some very, very interesting and individual styles. And then, of course, we have Fran Fra um, Franken, Franconia, where we have some gorgeous um, Riesling vineyards. So, again, don't forget Franken, Baden and Württemberg. Um, and there's also Riesling in Sachsen. It ripens um, on beautiful granite soils um, because the, these slopes just look beautifully um, to the sun, into the sunshine. And of course, you have Riesling in Saale und Stroh too. So I'm telling you that Germany has 13 regions across four degrees of latitude with any imaginable soil. And you've got Riesling in every single one of those regions. And then people think, what is German Riesling? And they try and define it. And they try and say, oh, this is German Riesling. But that doesn't work because German Riesling can only ever be an umbrella term for this wild, amazing, mind-bending varieties and diversity that you actually have. Because how could you compare um, a Riesling grown on granite on the slopes of the Black Forest to one grown on slate in the Mosel, to one grown on, um, on Triassic limestone in Franken, to one grown on slate in the Middle Rhine in a really cool, cool lateral valley. So in a way you have, you can't just say what is German Riesling because German Riesling is everything. And this is where it becomes so difficult because there, is, there are no simple answers. I wish there were, but there aren't. But hey, that's why all of us have got between 1.4 and 1.5 liters of brain, so we need to use them. The latitudes, and I love this because again, if I give you information, it only makes sense if it comes with context. And so, for instance, Stockholm in Sweden is at 59.3 degrees north. Edinburgh in Scotland is at 55.95. Right now, here in London, where I am in northeast London in Leytonstone, right now we're at 51.5. And then you have Dresden, Meissen near Dresden in Saxony is at 51.16. I told you German vineyards go up to 51.5. That would be the northernmost outpost in Saale Unstrut. But so the R is at 50.5. Rüdesheim in the Rheingau is at 49.98 north. However, if you go to Schloss Johannesberg in Geisenheim, and if you stand on the vineyard and the be it's beautiful Schloss Johannesberg, Johannesberg is this, is this beautiful um, Schloss, this chateau at the top, and it has got this slope down to the River Rhine. And this very vineyard is exactly on the 50th degree of latitude. And they put up a sign and it's wonderful to, to stand there and to think, oops, here I am exactly on 50 degrees north. Just the just same as when you go to Greenwich and you can stand on the zero meridian of longitude. And then you see that Würzburg is almost as far north as the Rheingau with 49.78, the Mosel 49.75, the Pfalz at 49.35. So you actually are not moving that far for north and south and yet the styles between Pfalz and Mosel are so different. So we know there's more to um, topography and soil is, more, is, is just as important as latitude. But as a comparison, think at 49.26, you have Reims in Champagne, and we all know what the wine style is there. And then you just cross the border into, into Pfalz, and we know that they have a very different style of winemaking from Reims. And you know why that is? Because of the hard mountains. The hard mountains are the continuation of the Vosges mountains. And this is a north-south axis 
and these mountains stop the weather. So they are a break between the Atlantic influence that still hits Champagne and then you are much more continental in Germany. So that's why you have such a different wine style despite very similar latitudes. Paris is at 48.8 and then Alsace is at 48. Whereas um, in Baden, you have, because Baden is so long and thin along the River Rhine, you go from 47 and a half um, in the very south of Baden to 48.46 in Offenburg and then even further north to the Kreichgau near Karlsruhe. We know Burgundy is at 47, Ampuy in the Rhone at 45.8, Montpellier in the Languedoc at 43, Florence in Tuscany at 43, Jerez, Andalusia, where you have a sherry, is almost an African latitude with 36 degrees north. Just to give you a latitudinal context and why, um, again, to explain that the styles are so different between Baden Riesling and Saxon Riesling or Mosel Riesling because you have such, um, such a lot of latitude. Now, Germany is Riesling central and Germany has the world's oldest and most diverse Riesling culture. And we can say, looking at Germany historically, that German wine culture as we know it today, even the German wine law as we still know it today, defined itself via Riesling. If I go into this, I still be sitting here talking tomorrow at midnight because it's such a fascinating subject, but Riesling really shaped the way Germans think about wine. Um, and I can, I, I write a lot of history in my book. Um, so if you're interested, go and read that. I, I just find it fascinating. But then I also know I need to stop myself and stick to the point because I always get carried off by um, historic uh, consideration. And now, this is a central sentence. It is here in Germany that Riesling reaches its most diverse expressions. Just because you have so many different soils, so many, so many different climatic zones. Sometimes you are close to the river or you are further away from the river. It's like topography also makes a difference whether you are um, at the top of the slope, at the bottom of the slope, in a flat vineyard or in a steep vineyard. There are all these myriad of aspects that change Riesling in so many ways. And it is in Germany that Riesling emerged as a quality variety in the course of the 18th century. And it was made famous by these historic regions. Rheingau, above all else, made Riesling famous from the very beginning in the, in, in the Middle Ages. And then in the 19th century, Mosel Saruva really gained importance as did Rheinpfalz and Rheinhessen. And this is why people always think of Rheingau Riesling, Mosel Riesling, Pfalz Riesling, Hessen Riesling, and sort of forget the satellites of the, other, of the other regions, but please don't forget them. They are just as important. And here again, the map, but this time, this is the map that highlights the rivers because that is so important. So we have the Elbe and we have Saale und Unstrut. And then we have, of course, the chief wine river in Germany to which all else is a tributary, and that is the River Rhine. And it comes out of Lake Constance on the border with Switzerland, and it flows for a little bit, it flows west, and then it turns a corner, and this is where it starts becoming the wine river. And even here, where it still flows from east to west, this is where you are on the Swiss border, and there is a vineyard which is called the Weiler Schlipf in Weil am Rhein. I just love saying that. Schlipf. Try, try saying that after a glass or two of Riesling. <laughs> um, but so you have this really, um, this wine river. And you see that um, the river Rhine defines Baden, defines the Pfalz. It is the Neckar, which is another Rhine tributary that goes um, through Württemberg, and then it defines and frames Rheinhessen. Franken is on the river Main, and the Main runs into the, in, 
into the river main in, in mines in cost time. Then you have the Rheingau, which really is created by the fact that the Rhine wants to go north, but then it hits the Taunus Mountains and it can't, so it has to make this bend towards the west, thereby creating the southern slopes or the south facing slopes of the Rheingau. The Nahe is another Rhine tributary. The Mosel is a Rhine tributary. The Ahr is a Rhine tributary. So the Rhine really is Germany's wine river. And rivers are so important for German viticulture because they create the slopes and the microclimates that allow grapes to ripen. So what I already started saying is that the variables are endless for Riesling. So think of the soils, think of the climate, think of the styles because you can make Riesling from bone dry to lusciously sweet. You can have easy drinking Rieslings that were perfect for, you know, sitting by the river in a long grass and just um, drinking them away as though they were lemonade. And then you can have immensely serious age-worthy Riesling too that are almost like Vino da Meditazione, which is this beautiful Italian concept of wines that you savor very slowly because they make you think and you think about them. And then we have in Germany an almost clean-cut clinical style of Riesling from stainless steel with cultured yeast. It's a squeaky clean, super slender and sort of like, yes, almost clinical in its cleanliness. And then you have the opposite. We have very funky Riesling with sort of really a nose of spontaneous ferment with lots of reduction. And so Riesling is, is kind of in every aspect you look at it, um, it can do anything. And this makes it so hard to think about it because it is so many things. And of course, a few years ago, people even started putting Riesling in new oak. It can even take that. And I must say, I actually quite like that um, because it just gives another spin on Riesling. And if you love Riesling, well, the world is your oyster. There's something for anyone. And now if you think of all of these aspects here, again, all I can say is that what is German Riesling? It is so many things. It is so many things. And to say, for somebody to say like, oh, I don't like German Riesling, is basically, you can say you don't like Riesling, which I understand because not, thankfully we all like different things, but to say I don't like German Riesling is qualifying it in a way that doesn't make sense because what is German Riesling, okay? So now I talked a lot about latitudes. And I talked about the fact that Riesling is a late ripening grape variety. And we know that for instance, 2018 was a super, super hot year and even Riesling was harvested in August, but that is an anomaly because usually Riesling ripens later. And um, sadly today it's July, but we have a very overcast and cool day today. But um, imagine you are in the middle of Europe, not on a northerly island like we are here, but you're in the middle of continental Europe. So you have continental climate and you have fairly hot summers. And grapes ripen, but Riesling as the late ripener, so when you have the height of summer, when you have July and August with its summer heat, Riesling grapes are still mostly green. They do not ripen until later. So when Riesling ripens towards September and October, your sunshine no longer is the sunshine of summer. It's no longer the heat and intensity of summer. It is a much milder, gentler sunshine. And this is why I want to remind you that it is a light and not heat that ripens grapes. We all know the fundamental, fundamental principle of photosynthesis. Photo is the word for light. Because even today, as it is cool, and I'm looking out of my window where I see the big, the big beautiful leaves of my fig tree, even though it is not hot, they photosynthesize. The moment there is light, leaves photosynthesize. And because in Germany, with Riesling, as it happens later in the year, 
This happens with light, not with heat. And you don't need heat. Riesling doesn't need heat. It can take it, but it doesn't need it. And so the beautiful thing is that you have, if you have heat, this speeds up the metabolism. Everything happens faster. However, if you have the gentler late summer and autumn sunshine, you have a slow photosynthesis and a slow ripening that preserves acidity and gives this really long ripening period which allows the synthesis of aromas. And this is really key to Riesling, okay? And so you have, in Germany you can have moderate alcohol, a lighter body, lots of acidity, combined with so much flavor and with so much nuance. And this is why Riesling excels so much in Germany, because this is where it is possible. And this is in those marginal climates of the Saar, of the outer reaches of um, the Nahe River, um, on the higher altitudes of the Mosel. You can really tease this out and let it happen very late. And this is where you get those most thrilling and playful and nuanced examples of Riesling. And then there is this other thing. I don't know if I've written this on a slide or not. No, I haven't. Um, the other thing is if you are at higher latitudes, you have longer daylight hours in autumn. So you have, if you are in Rome, you have at least half an hour less of daylight than when you are in Frankfurt, just by dint of latitude and the way the earth tilts itself towards the sun. And again, this is just another aspect of having um, this kind of not intense heat, but light and long and gentle and cool light, cool light in the morning, cool light in the evening, not the hot midday sun. So you see, I hope you see what I'm getting at. So now the dreaded subject of Prädikatswein. And um, while German law allows Prädikate to be used for all sorts of grape varieties that actually don't make much sense um, unless you talk about Riesling. And it is only really with Riesling that they still have a valid currency. And people also still sometimes think of the Prädikate, Kabinett, Spätlese, Auslese, Trockenbeerenauslese and Beerenauslese, Trockenbeerenauslese and Eiswein. They think of them as a quality ladder, which is wrong um, because it's a ripeness ladder. And the minimum ripeness levels are prescribed for all of the Prädikatsweine, but there are no maximum levels. And this is what's really wrong with German wine law. So um, if, for instance, a winery has got a great reputation for cabinet wines, but you have a year like 2018, where actually um, all of your grapes are far riper than for cabinet level, you might actually be bottling Spätlese and labeling it cabinet, and that's legal. And this is why this is so confusing. And this is why I was so annoyed when I had to pass blind tasting exams where people willingly put cabinet in front of you and, and expect you to recognize it when in fact it might be from a riper year. And you taste Auslese and you're not mistaken. So um, this is just one hell of a confusing system that stems from a time when, um, when Germany was still a lot, lot colder. This is pre-climate change Germany, when it was hard to ripen grapes. And when these minima, these minimum levels of ripeness actually meant something, today they mean nothing anymore. So we need a new kind of yardstick for the Prädikate, and there is a yardstick, we'll get to this. But let me just move on here. Again, if I start going into this, I'll still be sitting here tomorrow midnight talking about Prädikatswein. 
So here you have a beautiful scale of the German wine law. And this is, I will not go too far into this, but you see the minimum levels here are just ridiculously low. And um, you have Deutsche Wein and you have Landwein, which basically isn't really exported at all. And then we have the greatest category of wine that is made statistically is Qualitätswein. And then you have the Prädikatswein. And now people think Prädikatswein is better than Qualitätswein, when in fact the law does not allow you to distinguish really between the quality. And this is what makes German wine law such a dog. German wine law is confusing and to a degree idiotic because this is what it's based on. And this is also why, you know, you could, it's happened to me that I've gone into a co-op in Baden and looked at their Pinot Noirs and they have a Pinot Noir cabinet, which doesn't bloody make sense, at least not in the 20th century anymore. It might have made sense in the 1980s, but those days are gone. And yet we're still settled with, these law, with this law. So the only difference between Qualitätswein and Prädikatswein is that you can chaptalize Qualitätswein, meaning you can enrich the must with sugar, where you, whereas you cannot do that to Prädikatswein. However, if you look at our climate today, what is far more important for winemakers is to retain their acidity. So chaptalization today in Germany is not really necessary anymore. It might have been in cooler years like 2008 or 2010, but even then people who understood what they were doing weren't really chaptalizing. And so also this is just, this is the German statute, the law, but you all know the wines from the VDP, from the Verband Deutscher Prädikatsweingüter. And you know that their top level wines are Große Gewächse. Yeah, GG, Großes Gewächs. All of the Große Gewächse are labeled as Qualitätswein. So because the law being so idiotic and so such a hangover that has never been such a hangover from a very different climate, and I mean climate as in weather, um, and we still have this law, it somehow does not make sense anymore. And some Qualitätsweine are, far, are of far, far better quality than some Prädikatsweine. So the German law here does not help you in determining quality. It helps you in determining style. But this is as much as I will say, because this is a can of worms, okay? And if anybody wants to know about German wine law, we'd have to do a separate session on this. So, um, this is the best photograph anybody has ever taken of Riesling. My friend Ralf Kaiser took this on one and the same day, on an October day, in a vineyard of, um, God, Clemens Busch in the Mosel. Uh, I just was looking for the name. So, and with all of these grapes, all harvested and picked on the same day, you can make different styles of Riesling. So with your greenish grape here, you would make a cabinet wine. With this fully yellow ripe grape, with these two here, you would make an Auslese. Here you would make a Spätlese. And here you would make a Beerenauslese. And finally, a Trockenbeerenauslese. And the funny thing is that depending on where your vineyard is, and this is a Mosel vineyard, and the way the grapes are trained on a single stake rather than in a trellis where you have a fruiting zone where you can achieve far more uniform ripeness. But if you have a traditional single stake vine in the Mosel, which may be ungrafted, which may be a really old kind of selection of Riesling, you can get all of this on the same day. And this is how 
the idea of these predicate actually came about, not because your entire vineyard just reached this ripeness or your entire vineyard reached that ripeness. No, because you could harvest selectively. You could go into the vineyard and harvest all of these grapes or all of these grapes. And sometimes there were years when you would never reach this later stage. And today, unless you go and harvest very early, you may not reach the first stages of, you know, like or your, when you have this stage of ripeness, there, there still might be too little sugar or, or too much acid. But sometimes Riesling is just, it's not like Pinot Noir where you get a uniform ripeness or Cabernet Sauvignon where you have all of your grapes in the fruiting zone and you do everything so that they have a uniform ripeness. With Riesling, that's why you have this idea of selective harvesting for different ripeness levels. Sometimes an earlier harvest pass, sometimes a mid pass, sometimes a later pass, sometimes on the same day. And this is what you need to understand about Riesling that this is what is possible. And this is what determines style far more than must wait. Because here, what you, the first sort of greenish grape that makes a cabinet style today already has accumulated more sugar than say an Auslese or late harvest grape would have reached in the year 1985. So, while you still have these minimum, minimum levels of Uxle, which is the weight of the, the amount of sugar in the juice as it's harvested. Um, so these have all shifted. And yet you still have these styles. And you, of course, you realize that this greenish grape makes a very different style of wine from this golden grape or from this super ripe grape here that has already gone brown. So much. I mean, this is the best picture ever and so illustrative. It's this, this picture really explains why Riesling is Riesling and why you all have all of these different versions of it. So labels and terms, people, and now we're getting into the real meat because this is what confuses people most. How do I know that my wine is dry? And believe me, um, it is frustrating. Nobody wants to spend money on a bottle of wine when they can't tell what it's gonna taste like because you don't want to run that risk. You know what you like, you know what you would like to drink and yet you're supposed to buy Riesling and you can't tell. And the International Riesling Foundation have come up with this beautiful scale, but so few people use it, which is really idiotic because it would make life so much easier. But if the alcohol level, the alcohol level really tells you a lot, anything up to 10, percent ABV is either really sweet or off dry. Anything around 11 is off dry to dry depending where it's from and anything at 12 or above really should be dry. And then of course you have the German wine lingo. It says trocken means dry but in Germany legally trocken can mean up to nine grams of um, sugar. But if you want to have nine grams of sugar in your trocken, you must have at least seven grams of acid. And that really is operative. And we get to this. There are separate slides on acid and sugar, because this is one of the key things to understand about Riesling. So trocken, usually people don't write it anymore if it's not really trocken. Um, and there is really bloody bone dry Riesling these days with like two, three grams, especially in super ripe years like 17, 18, 19, there is no real reason to have residual sugar unless you want to do it stylistically. And then we have the beautiful word fine herb. The word fine herb is not legally defined. So trocken, halb trocken, lieblich und süß, they are defined terms in law. The term fine herb isn't, but that is its beauty. And this is what I would describe as off dry. And depending on where your acid is, your sugar can be anywhere between nine grams, 10 grams, 20 grams, even 20 grams can still taste fine herb if you have a killer acid. 
And so one of the things I want you to go away with today is understanding that if you ask for sugar, if you ask the winemaker or if you look at a list of stats and you only look at sugar, you're only looking at half the picture because the missing information is the acid. Okay, so let's move on. Sugar. The two chief sugars in grapes are glucose and fructose. And as grape juice ferments, so fermentation turns sugar into alcohol, turns juice and must into wine, um, yeasts prefer to metabolize glucose. So when you have residual sugar in Riesling, then this is fructose. And fructose is sweeter, comes across as, as sweeter and fresher than glucose. And um, it's actually when you bite into an apple, the sweetness of an apple will be fructose. Whereas if you eat grapes, that'll mostly be glucose. Uh, and I mean table grapes because um, they don't have that much fructose in them. But so um, in wine, we know that yeasts metabolize glucose first and then fructose. So when you have residual sugar, more likely than not, it's fructose. And you can have any level of sweetness. You can have really, really, really bone dry Riesling or lusciously sweet Riesling. And this is something that I have learned in Champagne, not in Germany. But it's, 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 a, it's a principle once you have understood it, it makes sense. So if I take a really ripe strawberry and I put two or three grains of crystal you know, crystallized sugar on it, caster sugar. Not a lot of sugar, just a little bit. That sweetness acts as a flavor enhancer, not a sweetener. And if you've ever had the, uh, the, the opportunity to taste the same champagne without dosage and with a little bit of dosage, you will know what I mean. The wine will still taste bone dry but a tiny bit of sugar just gives that curve, that, that, that um, a little bit of emphasis on the fruit. So sugar is an interesting thing. Not all sugar acts as a sweetener. In tiny amounts, sugar acts as a flavor enhancer, just like salt acts as a flavor enhancer, okay? And now acid. The two chief, um, Acids in wine are tartaric acid, which is proper to wine, doesn't exist anywhere else, and malic acid, which is apple acid. And these are the two acids that define the acidity of um, wine. And Riesling, Riesling's freshness very often is due to sharp electric malic acid. And acid counters residual sugar and prevents it from being cloying while sugar buffers the high acid and creates balance. So you can never look at sugar alone or at acid alone. And if you think why Germany is so often associated with sweet wines or residually sweet wines, it is because in the second half of the 20th century, there were such killer acids in Germany, like 20 grams per liter, bloody hell, you need a bit of sugar, otherwise you can't drink it. Those days are gone, but this is how this reputation came about, because you needed sugar, because you had such horrendous acid. But if you look at sugar, you also need to look at acid. And if you look at acid, you need to look at sugar, because they inform each other. Now, this is not something I've made up. This is something that I compiled once as I was doing my MW studies, um, when somebody gave me a supermarket compendium of all the wines that were sold in this supermarket, which had all of their analytical data, and I looked at all the Italian Pinot Grigio they were selling and, um, and the analytical data. And most Pinot Grigio had around four and a half grams per liter of acid, okay? And if you have a wine that has just four and a half grams per liter of acid, four grams of sugar already begin to cloy. 
However, Riesling, even in warm years, has at least six grams, if not seven grams. So usually you have anywhere between seven and a half and to nine grams of acid in Riesling. And it's usually also malic acid, which is kind of more electric and sharper. And then, so if you had a Pinot Grigio at four and a half grams of acid, and four and a half grams of sugar, it would already taste cloying. Now take a Riesling, which has nine grams of acid and four and a half grams of sugar, that tastes dry. And if you have a Riesling with nine grams of acid and nine grams of sugar, that begins to taste fruity and a little softer, but it still tastes dryish. So and if you then have from a cooler year or from some really high altitude vineyard, say a Mosel Riesling with 11 grams of acid, 30 grams of sugar will disappear. And this is, so you cannot never, never, ever look at sugar in isolation. You also must look at acid because this is the key. Now, understanding the interaction between sweetness and acidity enables us to use Riesling in a way that no other wine can be used. And if there are any psalms listening out, so whenever you have a sweet element in an otherwise savory dish, say you have um, a terrine, a meat terrine, and you have a bit of apple chutney on the side, that apple chutney will in that otherwise completely savory dish, that touch of sweetness will absolutely echo the touch of sweetness in a dry Riesling. And once you understand what's going on there, and once you experiment a little bit, you can play and you can make food and wine pairings that are compelling and that very few other wines can pull off in the same way. Now, my last point. I also wanted to touch upon this because this is what um, what happens a lot. This somebody noses a glass of mature Riesling, and I've I've observed this so many times. You pour somebody a mature Riesling, say five years old, ten years old, twenty years old, and Riesling ages like nothing else. This is one of the joys of Riesling that it really, really ages and evolves. And not only the top Rieslings, even simple Rieslings age and bring you these gorgeous flavors. So if you like them, lay down your wine, lay down your cabinet, not only your Auslays and your TBA. You know, there is joy to be had. And so, if you show somebody a mature Riesling and they swirl the glass, they stick their nose in and they say, ah, petrol. However, not all mature aroma of Riesling is TDN because this is what petrol, that petrol smell is, is 116 trimethyl 12 dihydronaphthalene. So no wonder we say TDN because that's a bit of a tongue twister. Trimethyl dihydronaphthalene. Again, try saying this after a few glasses. Um, that'll be fun. And so this is that petrol aroma. But there have been many, many, many studies that show that it actually isn't as prevalent in German Riesling as it say is in Alsace Riesling or in Australian Riesling. In Australian Riesling, you have it because you have far more intense sunshine. And what I talked about in those latitudes and the light, not the heat, that falls away in lots of Australia because what is considered cool in Australia is nowhere near as cool as some parts of Germany are. And so we know that TDN um, is, is a result of sunlight on grape skins. And the grapes and the juice themselves don't have TDN, but TDN is something that is made from a car carotenoid um, precursor that comes into the grape with sunlight. So if you expose your grapes to a lot of direct sunshine by leaf plucking, um, then you have possible flavor precursors for TDN. 
And also, if you have a fruiting zone in a, in a normal trellis where all of your grapes are in the same space and you pluck leaves to expose them to sunlight, it's a very different story from, again, your single high stake um, in the Mosel, say, or in the, in the Nahe, where you have um, grapes growing throughout different parts of the vine, at the bottom, in the middle, at the top, um, and they're usually shaded by leaves. So um, that also hinders the development of these precursors. And then we know that, for instance, um, Alsatian Riesling clones have um, a higher tendency to produce these precursors. But studies show that in German Riesling TDN actually isn't such a big deal. And the interesting thing as well is that you can have both bound and free TDN in your wine. And if you have, say, a Riesling, you buy a case of Riesling with 12 bottles and you open, you open a bottle after five years, it might have a very different um, level of TDN after 10 years because it dissipates and gets bound up again. And so um, TDN is this funny thing, but not all mature Riesling has TDN. And this is just another thing that is the bugbear of mine when people say, you know, they smell this heady, gorgeous scent of mature Riesling, which to me is far more reminiscent of chamomile tincture and of dried herbs and of, of crushed yarrow. Um, and they immediately say petrol when it isn't. So be careful and don't throw words around like petrol. And be happy that my sermon is now over and I haven't even mentioned the dreaded word minerality and I shan't. So um, this was my last slide um, and or my penultimate slide. And I still have to say, Riesling cannot be easily categorized. And that is both its strength and its weakness. It's weakness because people are confused by it and you can't blame them because it is confusing and because it is so wide, you can't ever shove German Riesling into a neat little box. It doesn't work. It's, it's, you can't do that. Riesling grows across Germany, across four degrees of latitude. It is incredibly diverse. And then you also have, you know, like, is it barrel fermented or stainless steel fermented? Is it dry? Is it sweet or anything in between? Is it spontaneous yeast? Is it cultured yeast? Is it from Kuiper, from limestone, from sandstone, from realit, from slate? You name it. It just, you know, like, it makes your head explode. It makes my head explode, but with pleasure. So, Riesling defies easy categorization. It's endlessly diverse. And there are just three things I want to leave you with. Versatility variety and value because Riesling is still incredibly cheap for what it actually is. If you think how much money you pay for even a run-of-the-mill Bourgogne Rouge or Bourgogne Blanc and then you think somebody sweats their ass off on a super steep slope in January doing the pruning doing the tending, the harvesting with tiny yields, and then you only pay 20 quid for a bottle of Mosel Riesling, it should be a crime. So, but for us consumers, that's cause for joy because you have great value. So now please hit me with your questions and I stop sharing my slide and I come on so I can answer your questions. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. I think I'm afraid that we all have only one, uh, only time for one question. And this is, uh, uh, this is a very important question that someone asked. And uh, I think we'll, we'll just uh, leave it to you to give a very concise uh, answer because it's a very big question. So someone's asking, what do Riesling producers do? Uh, in German, Germany to address the issue of climate change? Is it, you know, are they doing something specifically to address that? Absolutely. So, um, German viticulture was defined throughout the ages by the ability to ripen grapes. So, if you look at where the vineyards are in Germany today, you see that they are on slopes where, they, where grapes would ripen. And in the second half of the 20th century, every single thing that was done in Germany in the vineyard 
was done in order to ensure the ripening of grapes. Yes, so your planting density, your trellising, your training, your pruning, your canopy management, every single thing was done in order to ripen grapes. Yeah, this defines German viticulture. And now the world hears this thing once, and then, of course, it's a logical conclusion that it's getting too hot for Riesling in Germany, which is frankly idiotic because we know that Riesling can ripen in, in a wide variety of climates and actually is wonderful in warmer climates like in Eden and Clare Valley. And until Germany gets to those temperatures is a long way yet. So I want to dismiss that and want to take you back. Why did I make such a point that everything that was done in the vineyard was done in order to ripen grapes? Now imagine you dial all of these things back. Imagine you adjust your canopy height so that, that you have fewer leaves to photosynthesize. This will slow down your ripening. You know, people in Germany had huge canopies in order to capture as much sunlight in the leaves as possible in order to make these grapes ripen. If you lower your canopy, if you shade your fruit, if you change your trellising and your pruning, there is so much you can do to just dial all of these measures back and to get a different kind of balance and to adjust to a climate, to, to this new climate. And it's actually interesting that um, the summer of 2018 with its heat waves was so um, extreme that it really made everyone think. But by now, whereas in the past, your, your, um, you waited, waited, waited sometimes until late October to harvest your Riesling. Now you harvest it earlier because you remember that photograph of those ripeness levels. Your picking decisions are different. Your, you know, so we are still at a point where Germany is a beneficiary of climate change. We do not know what will happen over the next 20, 30 years, but I, I just hate the fact that every discussion about climate change is framed in terms of grape variety when it should be framed in terms of viticulture. That's a great answer. And so, Anne, thank you so much. There will be uh, probably a couple of uh, very small questions which I might just, uh, you know, take it offline with you and then we can send Absolutely. Them. Yeah, and I'm just a bit uh, conscious of time, but it has been amazing. And thank you for such a detailed and a wonderful explanation about Riesling. So I'm pretty sure everyone will know everything about German Riesling now. Not everything. There's much more to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so to know more, here is the Bible to buy. <laughs> All right, so once again, thank you everyone and especially big thanks to Anne as well. And uh, the session will be recorded and I will send a link to everyone. And, uh, you know, if you want to catch up, if you want to practice how to pronounce some of the terms, this is going to be very, very useful. Okay, so thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon and go get and try some German Riesling. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.